Welcome to the Living Out Podcast, helping people, churches and society talk about faith and sexuality. Hello and welcome to the Living Out podcast. It's great to have you with us. Uh, My name's Anne and I'm joined this week by my friends and colleagues, Ed and Dan. Hello, fellas. How are you? Uh, Fine, thank you. Not too bad, thanks. Not too bad. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. In this uh, series of the Living Out podcast, we're going through each chapter of Ed's book, The Plausibility Problem. And today we're tackling misstep six. Uh, Men and women are equal and interchangeable. And I thought that given we're talking about men and women, it would be interesting to know uh, when you were younger, if there was a man who inspired you, who you wanted to be like when you grew up. Uh, was there anybody that, that comes to mind, Dan? Um, I had quite a lot of sort of female role models, which probably tells quite a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> but um, I think probably if I had to pick someone, maybe my older brother, he was that a little bit older, better at sport, popular easy to get on with I don't know I probably looked up to him quite a lot (laughs) does he know that you looked up to him (laughs) well I think probably when we were younger it was more him winding me up and me getting upset but now now we get along (laughs) so I hope he knows now (laughs) that's good to hear that's good to hear Uh, Ed what about you well this is really difficult I'm just thinking it's basically a cross between C.S. Lewis and Harold Wilson Oh my goodness! Do you know I might have known there'd be a politician in there somewhere. Well, I just, I just, I mean, you know, I was really into, I was massive into so C.S. Lewis's uh, Narnia Chronicles and his books and his letters, but then I also got into sort of politics. And Harold Wilson was the first, was the first person I read a sort of full scale biography of. And actually, they're both, they're both, they were both balding men um, who smoked pipes. <laughs> So um, that was really, so, clearly, that's clearly what I wanted to be. And actually, I've got plenty of hair, and I don't smoke a pipe. But you know, there's there's time, isn't there? There's time for there me is to time. Finally... There's time for both. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe some slippers as well, just to complete yeah, the I'm pretty complete sure they, the look. They, they both look like slipper wearing men to me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you've both given really, really good, you know, thoughtful, profound answers. I was. <laughs> that's what's profound My... about this horrible mix between C.S. Lewis and Harold Wilson. <laughs> that's most people's nightmares, Anne. <laughs> my uh, the person that I aspired to be when I was younger I, I mean it's such a cliche but Wonder Woman obviously <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't want a lasso of truth <laughs> oh. and that outfit is incredible we just take a few moments to pray for Anne <laughs> <laughs> This chapter starts off by making the important point that men and women are of equal value and dignity. So I was wondering if we could unpack a bit more how the Bible supports this view and how we would counter uh, claims that it's sexist. Uh, I found it helpful in the chapter how um, it took us back to Genesis and how God created us in his image, male and female, and the kind of equal dignity given to men and women right from the start. Um, I think that's a pretty good foundation for what follows in the Bible. And then, yeah, I love how Jesus lives that out, demonstrates that. I mean, it'd be lovely to say that there were loads of Bible characters that treated uh, women well, but sadly, the Old Testament includes a whole lot of people that didn't, a lot of men that didn't treat women well. But then you get to Jesus and you get this amazing, well, just amazing man who treats everybody wonderfully, but in a particularly countercultural way, treats women wonderfully, um, mm. and um, you see that you know in you know his engagement, his conversation with the woman at the well in John four. You see that in the fact that women were part of the the group that that followed him, you know, around first century Palestine. You see that in him caring for his mother even as he dies on the cross. I love you know we're gonna um, we're recording this just before Easter Sunday, and we're gonna see you know his care for. You know, Mary were, you know, the first witnesses to the resurrection or women uh, that were his mm. friends. So all of that is just a beautiful, you know, sort of living out of Genesis 1 verse 27 in the life and ministry of Jesus. 
Yeah, I I think that's that's really key. Uh, when I guess I was quite a sort of feminist when I was younger, and um, one of the things I was really worried about when I became a Christian was, you know, is there a place for me as a sort of strong, independent, single woman who likes to lead and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was sort of worried that, you know, some things that I'd seen in church culture uh, would be reflected in the Bible, that women were to be subservient and, you know, only have specific roles as wives and mothers and that kind of thing. And then so it was gloriously refreshing when I opened up the Bible and, and saw, you know, women leading and, and prophesying and being treated with dignity. And, you know, there's a whole list of biblical characters um you know, women who were doing things that were countercultural then. Um, so, you know, you've got sort of Esther and Deborah and, uh, you know, Miriam prophesying and Hannah, Ruth. Lydia had a, a church meeting in her house. I mean, there, there were women who sort of bankrolled the early church. Um, and then I found out that um, Paul's letter to the Romans was delivered by Phoebe, who would have been entrusted to explain that letter um, to the people who were hearing it. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole list more. Priscilla, Dorcas, Mary, um, all kinds of, um, you know, women were absolutely integral to Jesus's ministry and um, totally valued by him in a in a society that didn't value women um, so yeah refreshingly uh, positive about women even more so than than our culture in some ways and we'll probably come on to that a little bit more yeah and uh, I love how you, you picked up that you know Paul who's often portrayed by some people as, <laughs> as a misogynist you know actually has yeah. a whole long list of all his ministry partners at the end of you know, end of Romans, Romans chapter 16, and, you know, people who are involved in church planting and pastoring uh, with him and clearly leading in the early church include uh, women women and men, which is something that is just really important that we remember. And mm. again, just picking up at your point, Anne, that that would have been seen as massively countercultural, both in the sort of, in the Jewish world that Paul grew up in, but even in the Gentile world uh, that he was interacting with, seeking to reach. And, mm. you know, his household codes, you know, treating men and women with dignity within marriage, um, you know, profoundly sort of moving and countercultural. So, yeah, just re- really important, isn't it, all over the Bible? Um, yeah, that 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 foundational principle um, is um, well. We've mentioned that there are times when it doesn't happen, but in, in in Paul and in Jesus, we see that wonderfully applied, wonderfully lived out. Mm. And even when you see that it, it it doesn't happen, it just shines the light on the goodness of God's purposes for us in sexuality, in the way that we relate to us, because we see biblical characters messing up and deviating from that, and we see the the dire consequences. Yeah, and I think just as you you mentioned the sexuality word for the first time in this podcast, <laughs> um, at, we we did well. We, there. we did We're well. We like did well. I mean, in. people will be thinking, have they lost the plot? But yeah, I just <laughs> I get I get one of the things I found really. Actually, beautiful recently is just recognising how there are some secular voices in our culture. Um, you know, say someone, uh, you know, a liberal feminist like Louise Perry in her The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, basically saying, mm-hmm. I mean, she doesn't say it in these words, but she says, you know, if you want to flourish as a woman, um, if you want to be safe as a woman, um, get married um, to somebody who you would be happy to, you know, be the father to your kids and it oddly it's a sort of it's a book written i think last year that's basically saying biblical sexual ethics and what the bible teaches about sex and marriage are good for women and good for protecting women mm. um, from all the things that sadly have gone wrong uh, where men as they are in society today are allowed to use and abuse women uh, too often mm. Mm. Fantastic. And, and a Christian book that I found really helpful, uh, it's called Liberated by Karen Sewell. And, uh, you know, she she's a, a Christian leader, got a great ministry herself. And she she sort of addresses uh, this claim that the Bible's sort of sexist and unfair to uh, women. Um, she, she unpacks a lot of what we've been talking about in a lot more detail and shows how the Bible really values and dignifies women. So that's Liberated by Karen Sewell, another very good read. So given that, uh, you know, it's clear from the Bible that men and women are created to be completely equal in value, um, how how can Christians push back against some of the unhelpful things that we do in church culture? I'm thinking particularly about, again, um, about gender stereotypes that often lead people into confusion about gender identity or 
or sometimes seek to devalue women or or devalue men in, in some respects as well. Uh, how can we push back against those? I mean, I think as with a lot of things, following Jesus' example as best we can is a good place to start if we're taking him as a model of masculinity, then that's already quite a countercultural way um, to be a man. Um, and I think living that out has a big impact. I think in the churches I've been in in my life so far, I think you do notice a difference in men in church compared to other men um, that, yeah, that I know or that you'd meet in other contexts. Um, I think in terms of like their gentleness and humility often um, and I think that helps to kind of break down some of that pressure in some way to be what our culture sees as like a manly man and to act a certain way or to be interested in certain things or treat women or other people a certain way um, so I think if we're yeah with God's help um, becoming more and more like Jesus and following his example more and more, then I think that's, yeah, often a good starting point, at least. I think that's a really good point, uh, especially about Jesus's humility, because I think sometimes we um, uh, we encounter very unhelpful power dynamics, uh, both in culture, but also in, in church as well. And we often uh, we often see men who think that leading means kind of asserting a power over other people and yet what we see modeled in Jesus is this servant leadership this humility yeah I mean he he says if we want to if we want to become the greatest we have to become the least if we want to um lead well we need to get down and wash people's feet I mean that that's an incredible display of uh what it means to be godly but also it shows that he was absolutely secure in his masculinity, he didn't need to lord it over people uh, like kind of worldly leaders would do. And I, and I think that's perhaps a particular challenge there and what you've just shared for those, you know, those of us who are parts of churches where they, where we do think that men should be taking the ultimate leadership roles, um, mm. that I think that often has been equated to be exactly the sort of male leadership that you've nicely argued against, that you know, people have the you know the the men in those roles have have thought that being a man, being a male overall leader, basically means being, well, I mean, I can think of some rude words, but just basically being very <laughs> very arrogant, um, overpowering men, rather than actually being like Jesus, which is what Christian leadership is all about. Is you know, <laughs> putting you know, sacrificing your life for others, and I think, mm. you know, just actually allowing our definition of masculinity um, to be Jesus rather than to be uh, secular uh, images or pictures or uh, experiences of masculinity is really, really important. Mm. And I do think this is where it, it's important for us to push back against gender stereotypes that are uh, that aren't biblical, that are more sort of culturally informed. Um, I think we need to be careful when we're putting on, for instance, single sex events at church. Now, I think there is a place for single sex events. I think sometimes it's yeah, you know, it's good for women to meet together, for men to meet together. Uh, but I think it, it becomes problematic when we sort of prescribe certain activities. So you know, the the men always get together for sort of curry and go-karting or something and the women all get together to paint their nails or whatever it is women do I don't know <laughs> um I think we need to include a whole range of uh interests and skills and celebrate the diversity that there is within uh you know within sort of masculinity and femininity and uh, you know there are, I, I was speaking at women's conference recently and uh, it, it was amazing we I was talking about gender identity and that kind of thing and it was amazing how many people said oh do you know I wish there were seminars on DIY or managing your finances and um, it, it actually led me to write a blog post about how we can run uh, better women's events because I think you know we often sort of make an assumption that we want you know we want all the branding to be floral and pink and we want to hear about you know being a good wife and mother and those things are important uh, but there's a lot more to being a woman and the same same for being a man as well not everybody you know wants to do sports and 
whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Eat curry. That's what men seem to do. Eat curry. <laughs> go hunting. Eat curry. <laughs> that's what it's all about, as far as I can work out. From every men's event I've heard advertised, seems to involve sport and curry. Uh, I don't yeah. mind curry as long as it's actually really mild. Um, but yeah, sport, yeah. Korma. Korma's the <laughs> limit, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. I don't. Yeah, that rolls me out. I think, and the other thing is just to look at. I mean, we talked about Jesus, but you know, David, King David, is another sort of example of pushing back against gender stereotyping. We don't, mm. we don't look at. You know, we we tend to talk about him being a warrior, but we forget he played the harp. I mean, that's a bit of a wussy yeah. thing, to hear, isn't it? Um, in our culture, and then you know, the wife of noble character in Proverbs thirty one. You know, is you know it's, it, that's sometimes interpreted well, what a wonderful housewife she is. When actually, if you look at the details, you know, she's amazing at managing her household but she's also a businesswoman she's doing a huge amount Mm. of stuff and we just sometimes selectively read um passages that actually have a much wider sort of sense of what it is to be Mm. a biblical man or a biblical woman and there's a much greater range Mm. in scripture than we often hear about Absolutely. As our colleague Andrew Bunt would say, you can be a godly man man and enjoy musicals and puppets. (laughs) Well, yeah, not sure where you can be a godly man and enjoy musicals. Can we have a podcast on that sometime? I think there's an argument against it. (laughs) Indeed. And uh, finally, for this section, how do you think that the positive biblical message uh, that women and men are equally valuable can bring some hope to our culture? How about this? I just think what's wonderful about it is that it's just it's just true. You know, it's it's just mm. an identity <laughs> that God has given us. We're equal. We don't need to prove. We don't spend our life proving that we can, do, as, a, as a man can do everything a woman can do, or that you as a woman can do everything a man can do. You know, that sort of the battle between the sexes, which has often been a sort of we have to prove that we are equal, actually mm. is something that we don't need to sort of dive into as Christians because God said that we're equal. The first thing he said mm. about us, we're both created, you know, male and female in his image. And therefore, we don't need to prove it because God said it. And it's true. Mm. And I guess linked to that, where we see in our culture where um, there is injustice and inequality, we have something to say into that. And that that's not how God sees things. Um, it's not how it would be in the new creation. Um, so there is hope um, beyond all that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, sometimes our our culture talks a lot about equality, but I do see, I do see a lot of inequality. And I, you know, I've been guilty of this, especially when I was quite involved in the LGBT uh, community. I think I was brought up going to, I went to an all girls school. um, I went to Rangers, which is like guides, but older. You know, I grew up with strong female role models, thinking women can do everything and basically thinking men were irrelevant. And, you know, I have lesbian friends who, who very much think like that, who actually you know, we'd be quite happy if there were no men <laughs> in their in their lives. And one of the things that being a Christian has, has really helped me is uh and seeing the biblical picture is that we're all valuable. We all need each other. Um and actually through uh through church and, and in other contexts I've met some amazing men who've enriched my life. Um and actually I've come to see, oh yeah, they <laughs> men are valuable too, it turns out. <laughs> Well, and I think that's and that's just really important because I think part of the experience of being someone who's same sex attracted can you know can be complicated relationships to opposite sex and same sex mm-hmm. and actually you know the, I I suppose I spent a lot of my a lot of my teenage years and probably twenties you know as it were loving men's bodies but not really liking what's inside them. And, you know, not feeling attracted to women's bodies, but actually finding it much easier to get on and work with women. Um, Mm. And actually just the Bible's message that men and women are equal has helped me sort of be much more, you know, sort of process that better and actually recognise the value in men and women and not to be so, yeah, sort of slightly warped in my my understanding and Mm. how that impacted my interactions with men and women. Yeah, I think I, I can see a real contrast with me between before before I was a Christian, I, there was a real sense of uh, competition with men. You know, I wanted to prove women were better. I wanted to well, that's revealing, isn't it? Women are better, uh, uh, and you know, I was picking up heavy chairs that I couldn't really lift because I didn't want a man to help me and all that kind of thing. Um, 
uh, and now I, you know, my life is much more about cooperation rather than competition, and that's just massively liberating. And I, I think you you see some very unhealthy competition between the sexes in our in our wider culture, and and I think that's something that the message that we are all intrinsically equally valuable. Um, that's a real tonic and that's something that we've got that's that's really positive to speak into that after the break we're going to be looking at whether the equal value of men and women means that we're essentially interchangeable if you're enjoying this series you might want to read the book that it's based on the good news for bargain lovers is that we have a special listener discount on the plausibility problem as well as ed's other book purposeful sexuality and andrew bunt's book finding your best identity Go to ivpbooks.com and use the code LIVINGOUT20, that's LIVINGOUT20, to get 20% off. I also wanted to let you know that the Living Out team is coming to my hometown of Manchester on Saturday the 13th of May. We'll be exploring sexuality in our culture, the biblical picture, and how we can support same-sex attracted Christians in our churches. Find out more and book a place at livingout.org slash events. So we've established that men and women are equal, but are they interchangeable? Ed argues that there are important created differences between men and women, that gender is not a social construct, it's a divine one. So in a culture that's increasingly reluctant even to define what a man or a woman is, how would you express the differences between men and women? I've reviewed a book uh, for the website, which I found really helpful on this, which was Sam Albury's um, book, What Does God Have to Say About Our Bodies? I think that's the right title. Um, But he kind of goes into some of the sort of, um, yeah, I guess mainly physical differences between men and women and how that actually shapes our experience of the world. Um, Kind of women typically being physically weaker, even if that's sort of uncomfortable to say in our culture um, but how that does actually shape their experience of life um, and how that's perhaps hard for men to understand because that's not typically um, how they experience the world um, but I just found that really helpful in terms of um, pointing out that reality and that there are differences between us um, and that it does have an impact you know we're not um, completely the same, we didn't have completely the same experience um, mm. as much as we might like to think so. Mm. I, can, I remember a conversation actually just picking up on that with a friend of mine who's in her 60s and we were just talking about why men so struggled with getting old and why men so struggled when their bodies began to sort of perhaps let them down a bit in their sort of 60s and 70s. And her point, which is a bit of a revelation to me as a man, was that um, for a lot of men, the first time that their bodies have sort of let them down or has been difficult, problematic, is in their 60s and 70s. When for women who've been having periods all the way since, you know, puberty began, they've had very painful experiences. Their bodies have sometimes, you know, let them down all the way through adulthood. And therefore they are just, you know, it's just been a very different experience Mm -hmm. of being an embodied creature uh, to be a woman you know, as opposed to being a man. And I obviously never thought about it like that and was quite mm. challenged by, I just take, you know, I, I take it for granted that uh, my body will function and that there won't be any sort of particular sort of issues at any particular time of the month that I need to be aware of because that might limit what I can do uh, for a few days. Um, and that is a massive difference between being a man and being a woman. Tell us more about it, Dan. Mm. <laughs> Oh gosh, do you really want to? No, know? well, perhaps we don't. Perhaps we don't. We don't know where people are listening to this podcast. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is. But I was thinking about it the opposite way around the the other day, and just thinking, gosh, what would it be like not to have periods every month? It would be amazing. Because <laughs> I mean, for me, it, you know, it massively affects my mood. I get all sorts of cramps and things. I mean, it does. You know, I I look at when I'm traveling and sort of try and plan it around when my periods do. Um, there's actually a book um, called A A Brief Theology of Periods I I think it's called, I'll put the link in the show notes, but I would actually recommend that men and women read it because I think we need to know about each other's experiences you know, being, being embodied makes a difference i mean you know to state the absolute obvious we have uh we have different genitalia we have different um types of bodies and that makes a difference to how we see the world and actually trying 
get a sense of what it's like for the other sex is is quite helpful i think um so yeah read it read a book about periods i know ed's already read it so uh dan you might have to crack on with that <laughs> well we, we, it was our book of the summer last summer we got over we, we encouraged everybody in our church uh, men and women to read it last summer i don't know if dan That's was brilliant. one of them uh, yeah, yeah i was yeah i'd recommend it yeah. there we go and I think there's a role um, that Christians can play in terms of helping, especially young people, to feel really positive about the body that they're growing into, especially during puberty as that body is changing. Because uh, I think, uh, you know, there can be sort of a shame over over sexuality and these new feelings that we're developing. Um, and I think as well, you know, we've just been talking about periods. Um, I think that can be quite a frightening time for young girls when the period starts and you know it's not very helpful just to have a packet of tampons and a book thrown in your direction um I actually got a friend um <clears throat> whose uh, daughter started her period and to celebrate it he took her out for a meal and you know sort of it, it was like a sort of coming of age thing to celebrate the the goodness of the body that God's given her and to celebrate her value as a woman and I just thought what an amazing positive way to help her feel uh valuable as as a young young woman and and then of course there are and this is where it's really difficult there are the sort of and this is you know we could descend into gender stereotyping here but there are the sort of observable differences sometimes in how some men or the majority of men the majority of women think that are often you know talked about in society a lot you know some of them are true of most of us none of them are true of all of us but Mm. it is just worth saying that you know men and women do often think in different ways and interact with each other in different ways um and without you know recognizing without as it were foisting the stereotypes on everybody we've got to recognize whether it's a comedy on tv friends or a, a novel from a few centuries back pride and prejudice or just our interactions on a lot of the teams that we're involved in on work or or, or wherever else, we notice Mm. that there are some differences in the way that men and women think and men and women interact. And obviously some of them will be culturally conditioned, but some of them would seem to have something to do with the fact that we do have different bodies and we do have different experiences of being in those bodies. Let's not over-apply them, let's not descend into gender stereotypes, but let's also just not ignore the fact that there are some differences and yeah. they do impact, you know, us all in, in different ways. Yeah, that was really helpful. Um, Ed, in, in your book, you go on to show that the reason for our sexual differences is primarily to put the gospel on display by giving us a picture in human marriage of the relationship between Christ and his church. Uh, we've talked about this quite a lot on the, on the podcast, so I would encourage people to listen to other episodes. And uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to our Marriage as a Trailer uh, animation, which kind of spells this out, uh, and an article by Ed uh, called What is Sexuality For? But Ed, it's it's eight years since the book was published. Can you believe it? Um, and the cultural conversation around gender has moved on quite a lot. Is there anything that you would change or or add if you were writing this chapter now? Yeah, I think I probably would spend, and I'd love to spend more time thinking about how our gendered bodies are different and how that matters. And in some ways, we've done a bit of that conversation just now. But I wish I'd written more on that, and I'd like to think and write more on, you know, the fact that we have been given different bodies by God and the significance of that and also just a recognition that 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 male and female bodies obviously are different but also it's possible to have you know there's an image isn't there of the perfect female body and the perfect male body that we have in society out there that are used to make a lot of us feel uh, lesser uh, um, or not proper men and women because we don't conform to a particular image and I think you know part of exploring the fact that we're created equal is I think you know undermining that idea that to be a man you need to have a certain type of male body to be a good a woman you have to have Mm. a certain type of female body so I'd love to have thought more I'd love to still think more about what it means uh, to have a different body and to allow there to be a range of different male bodies and different female bodies rather than just one particular sort of cultural sort of type that we're all sort of trying to conform to um and then I do think I'd love to think through, um, yeah, just how gender difference matters. And I have done some more thinking about this when it comes to, you know, why it's so important in a relationship for it to be a sustainable relationship, and in particular for it to be a sustainable sexual relationship, for there to be sexual difference, for there to, for it to be a man and a woman mm. rather than two men and two women. 
and in purposeful sexuality I, I i sort of share a number of perspectives from gay people none of them christians or actually one of them christians out of four of them just basically in which they're saying mm, in the gay relationships that we've been in the lack of sexual difference the fact that it's been two people of the same sex has been problematic mm. um and yeah. that's just them you know sharing that and reflecting on that now obviously they don't think the reason for that is because sex is for marriage between a man and a woman but what they say does fit in with the christian worldview and then i would like to think a little bit more about you know how you know without again going down into the gender stereotypes how we just you know how on the you know the living out team is strengthened by it being made up of men and women. You know, we just had another woman jo join the team, and that's been really important to you, Anne. But it's also really important to yep. the rest of us <laughs> to balance out the team and in you know church leadership to make sure that you've got women and men leading uh, together, even if you might say that men are taking the overall lead. Just having men and women working together in a complementary way is really biblical, and it's just so yeah. practically helpful. And I'd love to sort of think yeah. a little bit more about that. Well, I'm looking forward to reading the revised edition. <laughs> <laughs> well, it probably had to be twice as long, won't it? Volume three. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I mean, it's probably worth saying that um, obviously all church structures are slightly different and there are some churches uh, that sort of recognise um, an overall male lead to the church. There are other churches where uh, sort of more egalitarian uh, theology is followed and, and they would have a woman in charge but I think whatever church setup you have I do think there is something really important about having uh, diversity in leadership and having men and women uh, being listened to and being reflected in, in all areas of church life We touched on quite a few different areas in this podcast, but obviously there's lots more that, uh, thinking that we could do and, and reading uh, that we could do. Um, guys, I wonder if you could choose a, a resource each that would be helpful for listeners to uh, to think more about these issues. Uh, we read as a staff team embodied by Preston Sprinkle last year. I um, found that a really helpful look at um, yeah, transgender and... Um, yeah, all the different questions around that, um, written by Sky Preston Sprinkle, who's not trans, but is very upfront about that and has really taken time to talk to trans people about their experience and listen to them and let that inform his book. Um, and yeah, I guess we've been talking about how the conversation's moved on in the last few years. I think that's a really helpful resource um, in the current mm. culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great book, great book. Ed? Um, well, I, I, this is sort of slightly, are women human, Dorothy Sayers? I quote at the beginning of the chapter, and she's, you know, she was well known as a detective writer, the Lord Peter, Wim, Lord Peter Whimsey uh, sort of detective stories. But, you know, she's writing back in the sort of 2030s as a Christian woman about, you know, while living in a society that was massively gender stereotyped and where she was often looked down upon for being a woman. And she's just brilliant in pushing back against that. Um, our woman human is the yeah it's the title which sort of you know suggests the sort of the style of it and she's just actually beautiful about Jesus and and noticing um, as as we've noticed as we've talked about how countercultural Jesus was in interacting with the women uh, he met in Palestine two thousand years ago. Great, not come across that, so I'll add that to my list. And there'll be lots of other links, uh, to, not just to those resources, but to lots of other things in the show notes. Time's sadly up for today, uh, but if you'd like to explore this question further, um, first place to go is our website, livingout.org, for articles, videos, blogs, lots of other resources. I want to say thanks to Ed and Dan for joining me, and thanks to you for tuning in. Uh, do subscribe share and uh, rate our podcast if you enjoy it that helps us to be more discoverable and next time we're going to be looking at misstep seven godliness is heterosexuality should be a good one look forward to you joining us then bye for now <laughs>